It's finally coming. After a brief lull following the FAA's confirmation that the test date for the second Starship flight is now in the hands of the Fish and Wildlife Service, or the FWS, SpaceX is now ready to start conducting ground tests of the world's most powerful rocket yet again. Starship fully stacked while the team prepares for a launch rehearsal. We continue to work with the FAA on a launch license, the company announced yesterday, after putting Ship 25 back on Booster 9 at the launch pad. The huge test can take place as soon as today. Last week, the company informed the Coast Guard that it plans to conduct ground testing on Starship this week. According to the Coast Guard, SpaceX has informed the U.S. Coast Guard of ongoing testing at their facility located south of Brownsville, Texas, near Boca Chica Beach, starting on Tuesday, October 17th, 2023. During testing, a hazard area will exist in the vicinity of the SpaceX facility, extending into South Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. The area below represents the U.S. waters portion of the hazard area SpaceX identified as susceptible to potential hazards including blast pressure, debris, gaseous leaks, and fires during the tests. The date also matches road closures granted to SpaceX for its test site in Boca Chica with October 17th being the primary date and the following two days being backup opportunities. The local government's notice for the closure confirms that the test activities will be non-flight. The following two days serve as backup opportunities. It's important to note that the tests conducted will be non-flight activities, meaning it will be a crucial step towards preparing the Starship rocket for its next test launch. As SpaceX declared, it seems that the rocket could face a long delay as it waits for the FWS to approve changes to the launch pad after the first test flight attempt in April. Musk's company has made dozens of system-level upgrades to Starship since the April flight, and these primarily involve the rocket's engines, its propulsion system, and fire suppression capabilities. Most of the failures during the first Starship test involved its engines and the engine bay as SpaceX tried to fly a rocket with 33 engines for the first time in its history. The test also saw serious damage to the launch pad, and while some had predicted that Starship would have to be grounded for more than a year as SpaceX rebuilds the pad, the firm quickly installed a fire suppression system and tested it through a static fire. That Starship orbital launch attempt is a critical event not only for SpaceX, which is counting on Starship to further reduce launch costs and increase launch cadence, but also for NASA. The agency has provided SpaceX with more than 4 billion US dollars in awards through its Human Landing System, or HLS, program to develop versions of Starship to land astronauts on the moon for its Artemis Lunar Exploration Campaign. The agency is closely following SpaceX's Starship tests. I'm just thoroughly impressed by the scale of these pictures and what the vehicle looks like in an integrated stack, said Ryan Joyce of NASA's Langley Research Center, who was working on HLS during a panel discussion on the 23rd of January at the AIAA SciTech Forum, showing several images of Starship development. We are literally trying to launch skyscrapers here. NASA's insight into Starship development includes having astronauts visit to ensure that the vehicle can be safely operated by them. This is ultimately a vehicle that needs to be operated by the astronauts, he said. If you don't have the conversations with astronauts as crew members and operators of the spacecraft during the design phase, you might get far enough along with your design before you find your vehicle is inoperable. As SpaceX conducts Starship tests at Boca Chica, it's constructing a new Starship launch facility on the grounds of Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center. The tower for that launch pad now overshadows the existing pad used for Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy launches. It's very exciting to see the progress being made at SpaceX facilities right now, including at KSC, where they're building a second orbital launch capability, he said. NASA's HLS awards leave it up to SpaceX to conduct its lunar lander launches either from the KSC or Boca Chica, he noted. In short, we hope that today's test can bring Starship closer to its goal, reaching orbit and splashing down in the Pacific. In another piece of important news, Axiom Space 
NASA's third private astronaut mission is on track for a liftoff next year. Houston-based Axiom Space's X-3 flight remains on track for a launch toward the International Space Station no sooner than January of 2024. The four crew members, including a former NASA astronaut, a European Space Agency Reserve astronaut, and a passenger who flew to suborbital space with Virgin Galactic earlier this year, spoke with journalists on Monday, October 16th, about their excitement. I'm very happy to be a part of this mission and this great crew, Swedish astronaut Marcus Wandt said during the live-streamed press conference emphasizing that Acts 3 will include representation from government and industry alike in his country. I'm also proud of being trusted by Sweden and Europe to represent Sweden in space and throughout this mission, which to me is so much more than the 14 plus days in space and my background as a fighter pilot and test pilot as well. Acts 3 will launch to the ISS from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida using SpaceX's Crew Dragon spacecraft and Falcon 9 rocket. Axiom signed an agreement with SpaceX in 2021 to launch three additional crews to space after the pioneering mission Axe 1, which flew in April of 2022. Additionally, SpaceX is the only fully certified commercial spacecraft for NASA missions so far. The mission will be led by former NASA astronaut Michael Lopez Alegria, a dual U.S. Spanish citizen who also commanded at X-1. He will be joined by Wandt, who was called up from his reserve astronaut status when assigned to X-3, Italian Air Force Colonel Walter Villaday, who flew to suborbital space on Virgin Galactic's first commercial launch this past June, and Turkey's first citizen in space, Alper Gezerapci. It will be Lopez Alegria's it'll be Lopez Alegria's sixth space mission, Villaday's second, and the first for Wandt and Gezerapci. Lopez Alegria said the training is going smoothly and that the crew has learned a lot since Acts 1, when other ISS astronauts had to step in to help the crew with their tasks. He said Acts 1 was a startup mission accomplished on an aggressive timeline, and that Axiom Space has matured its process since that time. In the follow-up mission, Acts 2, in May of 2023, Commander and former NASA astronaut Peggy Whitson was tasked with fewer responsibilities to give her time to help the crew. In the meantime, NASA stipulated that all commercial missions must have a former agency astronaut at the helm. Moving on, have you realized that the past launches in recent months have all been from SpaceX? Indeed, SpaceX's dominance in the launch market became an unofficial theme of World Satellite Business Week, starting with the very first panel. Having such a dominant launch service provider is probably not healthy in general for the commercial prospects of the industry, said Vikram Nidamaluri, managing director of the telecom, media, and entertainment group at investment banking firm Lazard. No one wants a monopoly choking off one point of the value chain. He suggested that increased government investment might be needed to bolster competition in the launch market. I think critical and continued increases in government budgets focused on space and communications are going to be essential to pushing forward technologies, he said, and maybe even enabling a second or third launch company. One of SpaceX's customers agreed that the company effectively had a monopoly on the market. Let's face it, SpaceX is probably the monopolist right now, said Luca Rosatini, chief executive of D-Orbit, a company that has flown several orbital transfer vehicles carrying small sats and hosted payloads on SpaceX transporter missions. That was, he added, no fault of SpaceX itself, not because they wanted to, but because of many other situations that created this scenario. Even if SpaceX has a commercial launch monopoly, a separate question is whether the company is acting like a monopolist, using its market power in an anti-competitive manner. Answers to that depend on where the other companies sit in the market. Well, folks, that's about it for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching, and if you want to support our channel and get access to exclusive content, please consider becoming a patron by clicking the link in the description below. We appreciate your generosity and your passion for space exploration. As always, this is Kevin from Great SpaceX, and until next time, keep looking up.